I, I know as uh, Jane took me through to Los Angeles from time to time, I point out sort of the center of the city that has been preserved and it's been really a great city uh, because of that work. And this is true of you know, upwards of 50 or more cities throughout uh, California. So let me see. Uh, Jane, would you mind first? Uh, thank you, Thank you, Paul, for those introductions and uh, speaking on behalf of uh, Jean and myself. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to get together. Uh, we, we started out, Dean started out in redevelopment practice uh, before I did. Uh, we could have, be, we could have be, become competitors in a state when no, where no one else was uh, practicing redevelopment law at that time. Instead, we collaborated uh, and, and made a lot of uh, positive contributions to the law and became best friends in the process. Uh, today, uh, this is going to be an informal conversation between two friends. Uh, it's going to be unstructured and spontaneous. It's based on memory and not research, and it's a lecture and not a tutorial on redevelopment law, but more of a uh, discussion of how to develop a practice in a specialty field and make a contribution to that field. Uh, it's intended to be an oral history from a personal perspective, and so it's being recorded and taped for that limited purpose. And nothing we say today, because of the nature of our conversation, uh, is intended to be used in any litigation or administrative or legislative proceedings. That's the uh, a uh, disclaimer in my first. Yeah. We were the conservative ones. I was a liberal. That's real. We go to the legislature. The left one will kick us around. The right one will kick us around. We brought them together. And then we back to you. And all they legislate and take place. Uh, we're, we're going to try to cover <clears throat> a lot of topics today, but we may not cover them all in the time allowed. But we want to give you a flavor of, of the topics and how we practice and how we dress them. We're going to talk about the light, why it's important to what redevelopment, eminent domain, and the recent Supreme Court case of caused all the controversy. We're going to talk about federal programs. Yeah. The Kilo case is referring to how many of you read the Kilo case? Constitutional law. Okay, well, we'll get to that. Uh, we've, uh, Gene has some uh, interesting comments on that when we get to it. Uh, we're going to talk about how the difference between the federal programs and the state programs that evolved from those. We're going to talk about how redevelopment is financed. We're going to talk about development agreements, what the Urban Land Institute called public-private partnerships. We're going to talk about affordable housing in terms of the legislative process because that's where most of our legislative activity uh, was, was concentrated. And then we're going to sum up with some of the uh, one or two projects that we're most proud of or, or things we did in our careers and then provide uh, opportunities for questions uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm going to set the stage, and, and the stage is a condition of California cities and American cities generally after World War II. Uh, during World War II, internally in the United States, we had one of the largest in migrations 
of people predominant basically from the rural south to the industrialized cities uh, on the west coast on the east coast and in the midwest where the war industries were were built uh, airplane ships tanks trucks where they were located uh, there has been no significant investment in cities in America since the 1920s. Went through the Depression, you had WPA that, that uh, built courthouses and so forth, but no significant urban investment through the Depression and World War II. So we ended up with overcrowded, after World War II, overcrowded, uh, segregated housing because there were still restricting covenants in place until uh, President Kennedy eliminated them for federal programs in 1963 and the, the Civil Rights Act eliminated their enforceability in 1964. Redevelopment required uh, restrictions ahead of some of that. Uh, that's right. They were that, yeah. And then you have the end of the war. So the end of the war unleashed a pent up demand for new housing, which went to cheap land in the suburbs. Uh, and it was aided by FHA mortgage insurance, special mortgage insurance program for veterans, the GI Bill of Rights, which sent a lot of these veterans to college, and coming along in 1956, the Federal Highway interstate program which provided the uh, automobile transportation to those suburbs. Major retailing followed the population. So new retailing malls were built in the suburbs and during the 60s all the major retailers left the downtown, the core downtown cities. They went to the suburbs. So downtown and the central cities were left with a loss of middle class, loss of jobs, loss of rate of retailing, a poorer population, an older population, a deteriorated housing stock, aging infrastructure, obsolete land uses, and a diminished tax base to support all that. And the interstate highway moving people out. The federal money got out of that, and the federal money tried to get up after. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's working against itself. Yeah. So that's where that's the basis then for uh, addressing these problems through the mechanism of redevelopment. And one of the things that we want to talk about, that Gene, is flight. Why is why is flight so important to this whole concept? This gets us to the Kilo case, and uh, the case is the way we work. In California, you can't do anything to read it all without blight, the area being a blighted area. I'm not going into that more. In the Kilo case, they could have cut on, on the blighted basis. They decided to move the law along and made it so that you could use eminent domain for economic purposes only, whether or not there was blight just to turn and change your property into to, uh, some other kind of property without any blight. And their, firm, their firm filed a, uh, an amicus, brief. amicus brief and uh, worked on the blight all the way and did not ask for the full range. That case, everybody you talked to with that case, I wonder how many of you get this, is the city lost. The city didn't lose, the city won big. But they won so big that they were considered overreaching. And so now there's a storm of, of uh, law around uh, to try to get this thing solved. Now, let, let me go back and let you pick up on, on this point. Uh, in 1954, Berman versus Parker, the US Supreme Court, unanimously held that blight was, as the basis for redevelopment, was an area concept. And Congress 
enacted a redevelopment project for the District of Columbia. The, the question was, can you acquire by eminent domain property that isn't blighted if it's part of a blighted area? And the Supreme Court said, yes, we defer to the legislative branch's determination that the use of eminent domain is necessary to carry out uh, this public purpose. In other words, public purpose it becomes a public use for the exercise of eminent domain. The concept that was established years and years ago with the reverence. <coughs> That's right. And on many, many examples of that kind of thing. So, so the Kelo case, so, and, and so the Kelo case deferred to the legislature of the state of Connecticut and said, if the legislature determines that this is a proper use of eminent domain, we, the courts, will not interfere. Now that's not judicial activism, it's judicial conservatism. But the uproar came uh, <coughs> as a result of that case. The, it's a strange case because it's five to four, and the Thomas uh, <coughs> opinion said that what we want to do is go back to the old public use concept. And many, many people are fighting to go back to the old public use concept, but that will never happen. What occurred years and years and years ago, dozens and dozens of cases of held. I'm sorry. Dozens and dozens of cases have held that the public use means public purpose. And you know if you read the Constitution that you can't get uh, public use or public purpose any easier than the economics of that city in Kilo, Kilo was in. That's right. I mean, that, that's public purpose. They need, they need to increase the, the economics. So that's a public purpose. The question is, is that a just, justifiable public purpose under the redevelopment law? Not in California. And so uh, there are many, many reasons that people want to go to public purpose with redevelopment. One of the things, if, it's not, if you haven't noticed, there's a, there's a statute in the IRS code, a provision of the IRS code, that says whenever something is purchased under the threat of condemnation, whether it's in court or not, there's the threat of condemnation is there. Uh, therefore, you can go ahead and um, come out with very good tax-wise. Because in these situations, as you expressed, most of the stuff was built back in the 30s and 20s and was just worthless properties. Or even if it wasn't worthless properties, the values were way down. After going through the process, the values were way up. Bunker Hill had, had, uh, had a big project I worked on in LA. Bunker Hill had $800,000 in a 140-acre process project. $800,000 of tax of uh, property taxes. We'll go into tax equity more later. But when I left practice in 1980, that was running $18 million worth. The difference between the $800,000 and $18 million shows you the impression in that situation and how bad it is. This has all been solved pretty well in, in California. But other people sometimes don't stick with the, enter the uh, flight concept. Do you want, do you want you, to go wider? No, I, I want to ask you about the encyclopedia lots in a minute, but I wanted to say that the uh, there is a ballot measure on in California that will be voted on next Tuesday called Proposition 90. And it's funded by a wealthy real estate investor out of New York who has funded these in several states. The essence of that is to roll back eminent domain to public use and to uh, not only that, but 
change the measure of just compensation to make it more expensive to acquire property and then to say that if public use is required by the government and somebody else is operating that public use, an airport or, or uh, 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 any private party, the owner has to be off the plan uh, back or participate in, in that. There's an exception for blight, but it applies only to taking properties that are blighted and are a uh, nuisance. And it effectively would prevent the redevelopment agency from undertaking redevelopment in a major way. But the, the real, uh, the other real sword in that is that compensation would have to be paid if property were down zone or there were any regulation adopted that substantially diminished the value of property. Uh, I mean, that would be a lawyer's uh, uh, project for years if it passes and it's being moved on. Uh, well, I think it's the blind area is broader than you use. No. I think there's going to be some litigation as to what a blighted area is under the 90, Proposition 90. Do you want to pass this or there's still a loophole? Yeah. Right. Well, the lawsuits are already being prepared. And <laughs> in case it passes. But tell us that one of the uh, one of the interesting stories in redevelopment is how eminent domain has been used to take care of the problem of it, what we call encyclopedia lots. Tell us about that. Yeah. Life is slums. No question, it's slums. And the densities are out like, like New York. Uh, some of those areas are Within a few blocks, you've got enough population in density to fill the United States in very few other blocks. The densities are so bad in some places, so that can be blighted. You're going to have it so dense. And usually when that's so, you're going to find that uh, the buildings are upset, the buildings are not good, so forth. That's another form of blight. And most of the blight that's typical is that sort. The uh, encyclopedia blight, I have one project, they had another one uh, in Southern California where hills were roving up and down and uh, some people subdivided by the old subdivision laws in 1920 or whatever it was. Yeah, it was early 1920. Uh, encyclopedia salesmen went around the world selling Encyclopedia Britannica and you buy a set of Encyclopedia Britannica and you get a lot, an oceanfront lot in Southern California or a view lot in, uh, in San Francisco. And these are little 25 by 15 foot plotted lots. <laughs> going up vertical walls. They were just a bunch of crooks. They were charging you five minutes for the encyclopedia and giving you the lot. And uh, then later on you found all you were doing was buying an encyclopedia. Know what happened? Nothing happened. It just sat there and sat there, and, and finally, all that property belonged to the kids and the grandkids and their grandkids. And uh, you could never privately make that property useful. It was totally uh, useless. That's blight. There's other other forms of blight. We'll probably cover as we go along, but. That, that's a big, big example. So it's not slums, it's not even the blight that we normally work with. Disuse, it's disuse of land, unused land, disuse of land. There's all sorts of uh, changes in the law. My problem is I left the, the field 26 years ago. There's a bunch of changes that I don't know. Then Joel will have to give them to you. Okay, uh, well, with, uh, with blight and eminent domain as being kind of uh, foundations, uh, redevelopment agencies are a creature of the state to perform a local purpose, and they're unique in that situation. They're extraordinary in that situation because of the powers they combine in one agency locally. It's eminent domain, it's land use planning, 
it's financing, it's controlling and regulating development, and it's being able to enter into developments with the with developers, agreements with developers to engage in real estate transactions like the like the private market. And you, uh, the Los Angeles agency was one of the first when you were general counsel. And the role of you as a, an attorney in all of those aspects was the important one, wasn't it? Yeah, well, like, the fact is that we don't we don't see the law as taught in law school. The uh, problem with law as taught in law school is litigation. <coughs> you take a number of courses and you go over them with litigation. I didn't learn any of this stuff. We became successful at it in law school. Uh, we like to practice the kind of law that's referred to as as uh, non-conflict, non-conflict law, non-adversarial, non-adversarial. Just transactional attorneys are very, very important. And yet, whenever I got a piece of litigation came into the agency, I could raise my rates. I should have been able to raise my rates if I kept them out of trouble. <laughs> no, and this is real. This is this is exactly what we did. We we played the game. When it came up, you're opposed to it. You're in favor of it. We meet with you and we find out why you are, why you are. And then we write the uh, the solution in legislation or otherwise. Don't forget that legislation is one of the aspects of of uh, of a lawyer. But let not not uh, lobbying. We wouldn't. We would not accept any money for lobbying. We appeared appeared in the legislature regularly, but we didn't accept any, and we're not lobbyists. The lobbyist is the global warming, non-global warming. Whatever decision they get out of any kind of litigation or the tobacco thing, you're, you're not going to get litigation that leads to the necessarily the solution. But rather, we were trying to get a solution to a problem, and it works. When we when we appeared in the legislature, we were trying to represent the broader interests of the field. And uh, you know, you were, I was, and you were often, I think, asked, "Who are you representing, Mr. Jacobs?" Oh yeah, Mr. Campbell, a state senator from, from Southern California, and a Mormon, by the way, leaned over and said. Your clients know what you're doing here. I said, no. <laughs> he was shocked. I said, I'm not representing my clients here. I'm representing what's the best thing for the development. We used to rewrite this kind of stuff out on the wall, on the back wall of the room when they said they'd go for this or go for that. We were able immediately to know that that would help the redevelopment field. And we also tell the redevelopment clients they can't go beyond certain limits. You've got to have a certain amount of, of uh, client control. Or you can't practice law properly. I had a lawyer recently who was told what to do by the redevelopment agency. And he uh, did what they told him to do. And I said, well, that's not the law. Said, well, that's what they wanted. I said, you're a whore. Listen to the chief justice. Listen to the justice. I did it Robert. I, did it most, I never saw, I could never play the game they played. But what they said was, well, at that time, that was my client. I never did a single solitary thing that was inconsistent with my ethics and what I think ought to be. I, it's a feel, it's a spirit of something that you ought to be in law schools. And we might even save the profession if we, this litigation nonsense keeps going. You can change and understand there's money to be made and there's things you can do as a lawyer without being in court. Now, our definite, our, our uh, we, I don't know, we lost one case and my client wouldn't let me uh, drop out. Well, I don't know whether you lost any, we didn't lose any, and we would go against the bad agencies that did bad things. That's right, and, and most of the uh, the, in the litigation we were involved in that went up to the uh, California Supreme Court was all the, all the cases where the court had an opportunity to say we're going to construe the law in such a way as to accomplish the beneficial purposes of redevelopment. The courts expanded 
the scope of the redevelopment law, the cases that we we did bring into it, uh, but the uh, uh, litigation. Litigation never got anything built, and it never developed the city. Uh, and and so I think our practice objectives were very similar in that regard. To stay out of court. And back to Kilo. Kilo had no business being in court. If we'd have been there, we'd have created a a uh, contract for that person, I'll call a non-participation contract contract in which they could stay in place. They let four or five owners in that place, in that case, stay in place. They had no, they had no business just uh, jeopardizing the whole field. I'm afraid we're going to be jeopardized permanently because of that case, even though it was one and one big. It's a strange, strange thing. If you go to litigation, think of the consequences. Uh, I'd like to uh, change subjects now, and <clears throat> because this is another area where you were in at the beginning, and that is to contrast the federal programs that began with the Housing Act of 1949 uh, and evolved into other programs that you were instrumental in, and how we uh, how we switched over to programs where we didn't need the federal money. Yeah, that was an interesting thing. The federal government was dominant because they were federal projects. That was not true. They were federal funded projects. They were the bank of the redevelopment agencies. But they, they just took it over and throttled you. They ended up with 40,000 acres of unsold land. What they did was you had to get you a local jurisdiction to get a federal grant, loan and grant, had to pre-plan the area without any uh, planners plan the area. Uh, planners did the economics on the area. You went out and cleared the area. You acquired all the property and cleared it. And then you went to find a developer. And when a developer come in, he'd say, your plan doesn't make sense. Your land price is too high. I can't develop here. But that was the state of what the federal programs were in doing to America. And so also, they took point. their, they got the most blighted areas, even in slum areas, and tried to get some new economics there. They go in the middle of a big slum area and try to sell some land in there. It wouldn't work. We developed ideas where we sold the land on their peripherals, close to the good stuff, and, and then grow out, grow in toward this. I would want to comment by George Lefko, who's uh, many of you, if you've been in land planning, you've read stuff. Of his, uh, he's a uh, leading, certainly I think in the West Coast of California, the leading professor on land, land use. And I talked to him a few days ago. He wanted us to ask you a few questions. I'd be to give you a few answers to a few questions here. I told him I'd give him the answers afterwards if we didn't cover it here. When I talked to him yesterday on the phone, he said, I can now drive, and he was not originally a friend of redevelopment. He said, I can now identify the redevelopment projects by driving down the street and see the good planning, the good pre-planning, the strong economics. And this, this was a turning somebody around. I didn't even ask him about this. He just got, got added to that to it. And he, this is... This also involves, as, as he said, all kinds of things in terms of quality of life. And uh, you'll find that redevelopment projects are, are strong in your community almost no matter where you are, and if you're from California. And Utah has a number of them too. For instance, this hotel, the hotel downtown, we did by redevelopment. I brought the developer up. The redeveloper man, the redevelopment uh, runs uh, through that hotel, the uh, office building downtown. Downtown has 21 blocks that are in redevelopment. 
the whole strip out in Orem is redevelopment, running where uh, from uh, State Street along 13 South, 15, 1200 South, straight through there with all those used car lots, all those restaurants. That's all ready to redevelopment. This city itself, has, Utah itself, has a lot of redevelopment. It's very, uh, very typical. Well, uh, over the over the years, the federal programs went to uh, went from uh, the the big loan and grant program. They went to a model cities program that gave the power to the mayors to to allocate the money, and then they went to a program that you were instrumental in having them create uh, urban development action grants. Yeah, I was I was uh, advising Atlanta, and I discovered the next president of the United States was going to be Jimmy Carter. They all knew it was. It was amazing. They had a peanut grade brigade, peanut brigade, and they were gonna, they knew he was going to be president. So they took our ideas. And put them into a, a statute called UDAG. Didn't tell me about it or anything, but they did. And then they called me and asked me to run the program. I agreed to run the program. I made a big mistake by not continuing through. I didn't go. But the UDAG program worked out all of the bad things that were in the uh, uh, federal government's transactions. First place, it took them. I had a project that took six years and six million dollars to get the late city council to vote no. They voted no and there was all that money wasted and spent. When we uh, developed the UDAG program, the federal government had to operate within six months and approve it. Although well, there's going to be some problems because the law required that. It was to deal with, with uh, Places that are ready to have their developer and have their developer and ready to to uh, build. And and the only thing missing was the final piece of the financing, the UDAC program. Yeah, and, and, and you, you had, in order to have a gap, you had a gap. Well, you're just going to get into the uh, financing. Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, we can come back to that. But uh, just one last problem. The uh, uh, Bunker Hill is going to get a two-thirds grant on a huge project. The Watts, no way to get any tax increment going or any economics going. We, I discovered that uh, this is something I don't think many people did, but I discovered that the program allowed you to Take any grant you don't use and to switch it to any other federal project that existed. So what do you know? Instead of us taking a two-thirds grant, at first we took a one-half grant and transferred all that money to, to Watts. We, we went all over the, you know, it didn't uh, keep the grant at all. <coughs> we, we used all tax increment for the grant. The, the tax increment program, uh, cities initially could not finance the local share of these federal programs, uh, federal, uh, the matching share of federal loans and grants. And uh, they tried several cities, including my city, Sacramento, put general obligation bonds on the ballot for the purpose of qualifying for federal money for redevelopment. LA2, LA2, and they all failed. Uh, the public, the argument for redevelopment in Sacramento at that time, 19 after the war, was it had the highest tuberculosis rate in the world, and it was because of the farm population that was a single man who overcrowded in in the. Uh, uh, the old parts of Sacramento that provided the farm labor. Uh, but anyway, those failed. So uh, a very creative solution was tax increment financing. 
that was put on a California ballot. Very simply, uh, the taxing agencies continued to receive the taxes they were receiving from an area before redevelopment. But after redevelopment, as the assessed values increased from investment, property taxes increased, those property taxes are allocated to the redevelopment agency to pay for the cost of redevelopment. The, the uh, power of that is illustrated by, in Sacramento, the Capitol Mall project, which took eight blocks of blighted property uh, as the entrance to the state capitol, redeveloped it, one single building, producing new property taxes, paid for the cost of that entire project area. Yeah, now this gets to the property tax, it could only have been done by Constitution. Property taxes are, when you look at your bill, almost anywhere in the country, you look at your bill, it'll be taxes for county, taxes for school district, taxes for all the local governments, the city, that's on one bill. The tax increments are, when there's an increase over the assessed value of what was there in the beginning, then you can get whatever grows on, out of that uh, tax increment. The tax increment, they call it, uh, that grows out of that increase in dust in value. And it's tremendously powerful. And it, it lends itself to a great deal of uh, creativity. You can deal with it with a shopping center, you can deal with it with a developer. You can deal with it with going to other cities. It could, you can't now, I guess. California, right. But when, what it did, ultimately, is it freed us from dependency upon the federal bank, the federal government, to provide the funding. And they, they were, felt awful about it. They felt like we were dirty guys not, not going along with them. But that flexibility, that flexibility made the, made our projects, and they became the model for the UDEC programs. You said they were market driven, they were done with developers, they were uh, more flexible and faster, and you just, you just got results. You did, you invested the tax increments in order to get results. The uh, tax increment financing gene developed, we had to develop ways to, uh, to negotiate transactions with developers uh, when, they, when they were aware that the agency would get these property taxes and have it available for uh, putting back into projects, projects that they would like to get some of the money for. Um, how uh, how did you handle or how did you deal with the, the developers? Talk about the role of the pro forma. Yeah, we had some people were giving the developer every time will walk in and say, and you'll see the toll we've all seen it. We need ten million dollars. If they if they say they need ten million dollars, you know they don't need ten million dollars. So you you find out what they need by getting a pro forma. Are you any of you in Kevin Murray's class? Oops. I was teaching that class when I was here with Kevin, and uh, we dealt with pro formas in that class. But what you do is you find out how much money they really need, and that is getting them to give you a pro forma as to the costs and the revenues and, and, the, and then in, by very, very fancy accounting you arrive at some name, some relationship to what the price is, what the price ought to be and what they needed. We call it a gap. The gap is there that they don't need, or that they do need. They have to prove there's a gap that they need. They don't get anything if they can't prove a gap. That's that, that's a process has now been embodied into the law of what was practiced 
became law, and now we're developing agencies before they make a contribution to a project participation are required to make a public report indicating what uh, the, the uh, economists, financial people call it residual land value, what the land is worth for the project given the uh, costs, the revenues, the value of the project that will be developed pursuant to the agreement. Uh, but it started out as practice and then and then became law. It's still we played a trick on them because the developer has four, four at least four uh, pro formas. The pro forma for for buying the land and convincing them. The pro forma for for their own self and they don't believe in. And a lot of them are so uh, optimistic they can't even believe in that. Pro forma the redevelopment agency needs because you need a lot of money with the redevelopment agency. Pro forma they've got for the uh, for the lender. Lender. And they, I never had and one of them deny it. My claim was four pro formers were there. So we had econ econ economics uh, financial guys on our side. Oddly enough, and oddly enough, we found out that the other side never knows what we're doing. And we always know what they're doing. But I'm serious. They 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 get to the end of the negotiation said that I didn't know that you believed that what you said. I said, No, we believe it. You gotta believe what you're negotiating and know everything you can know about the other side. And it isn't that hard to find out. But and, and hopefully if they find out what you have and, and what you're doing. It'll be quicker and easier negotiations. The better the attorney on the other side, the better you're going to have a negotiation and lack of litigation. I always, and, and I think we we shared, again, uh, similar practice styles, uh, even though we didn't practice together, but I always felt that my role in negotiation was to solve the problem for the other guy. And to do, in order to do that, I had to know his situation and understand his risk and his financing as, as well and sometimes better than he did. And furthermore, uh, I had to, uh, I didn't couch negotiations in the, in the, uh, uh, concept of zero-sum game. It wasn't a zero-sum game. It was maximizing the resources you had available. So I always started with, let's define the project. Let's decide together what the project is we want. Now let's cost it out and do the economic. Forget who pays for what. Let's just see if the project is viable from available sources. Then we'll start talking about how we leverage public money and private money and lenders. But the the uh, negotiations on both, I think we both did this, we're educating the other side as much as we're uh, to, yeah. to, you know, negotiating them. We each had a number of uh, shopping centers, major shopping centers in major downtowns. And I was meeting with Caldecott, what's his first name? John. John Caldecott, in each of these projects, because Broadway Hale and Payment Department stores was normally in one of those. And uh, we could have something go wrong, and one side be cheated out of, and then we'd go back and we'd renegotiate it. When we discovered we didn't get what we meant to get. And uh, he, they, he was the, the best developer's attorney I worked with. The, uh, the shopping centers are a good example of, of the way to uh, uh, not only look for creative solutions, but the uh, the way to find a better way to do something. And, and that idea came to me from a shopping center developer who said, every shopping center I do is a correction of the mistakes I made on the last one when it was Ernie Hunt. And I, so I've always felt that everything I do, 
I can do better the next time I come to it. Well, the shopping center problem was the major department stores were not convinced that they could come back downtown uh, under any circumstances. You had high land costs, you had very constrained sites, you had a land assembly problem, uh, you had they in the suburban locations they may have 80 acres and a lot of surface parking on those 80 acres. Uh, they have a single management of all the retailing. Uh, you come downtown and how can you present a comparable opportunity? Well, we figured out how to do it. And they beg to be downtown. Yeah, and, and uh, two people were instrumental in convincing the department stores they could come back downtown uh, in our projects. One was John Calcott. The other was Jerry Lipp, also with Broadway Hale, who was the former redevelopment director of Sacramento, of Sacramento and understood the redevelopment process. So we were able to say to department store, to shopping center developers, we can provide you the land at a price that is comparable to what you would be paying in the suburbs. We can assemble the site. Because the site's constrained, we'll have to build a public structure parking, and we'll put that parking either alongside or underneath your shopping center. We'll finance it, and we will allow you to operate it, that public parking as part of your center so that you will have a situation very comparable to what your major department stores are looking for. Uh, let's remember the department stores downtown, Broadway department store, had around eight or 900,000 square feet. It was as big by itself as uh, the shopping centers out in the suburbs. That's right. And when we put a downtown shopping center, these kinds of stores would drop down to 100,000, 170,000. Those are the changes that are made. And that has happened all over the country. The major, major, major shopping or department store downtown, the ZCMI is the example here, just didn't exist anymore. And the, the cost of a project like that, the land assembly, uh, again, in many cases, agencies didn't have the money to even start on these projects. So what did we do? We looked to the developer and borrowed the, made them, ask them to pay the purchase price up front yeah. for the land. That was one of the things, just as I was leaving, we got into it, was going to the developer said, pay for the price, right? put the price up right now. But this is after years of getting to know that they knew that we knew what we were doing. We put the money up before we even bought one scrap of land. But we don't do kilo, we don't make a mistake of having the chance that a kilo person can pull us up. We'd put it, if somebody didn't like it, we'd move the side a little bit. If somebody didn't like it, we might leave them alone. But normally, there's only about 3% of the people in any project that they're, they're usually stuck with bad land and can get a get cash out from a redevelopment agency. And so uh, it wasn't too easy, too hard after a while to get them to trust us. And, and it wasn't good they had to trust us. They could work alongside us. We'd work, we'd work it out, do what was necessary to make it work for them, to make it work for us. Now, you might say that the developers were taking a big risk, and they were in the, in the early days. Um, uh, uh, putting the money up front, the agency would give them a deed of trust back on, on that land if it didn't get developed. But uh, the, the, the agency also was able to, in a real estate transaction with them, allow them to control their costs. And a shopping, well, uh, uh, Gene was involved in Pasadena in a landmark case called the Graydon case, uh, which uh, uh, set a new uh, process for developers and build 
of being able to control their parking in Shepherdson. Yeah, that was uh, that one and uh, the Glendale Galleria were very difficult. The Glendale Galleria is a best, better example because the Glendale Galleria, we had parking could go alongside. There wasn't enough land. They had to go below. Uh, asking the project. Parking did. And parking would be exactly two sites the same. We borrowed, we borrowed the money from Calicom's attorney. We borrowed the money from Runway Hale and bought here. Here we could issue bonds for parking. And then the parking, if they didn't pay out, if they didn't go forward, we took risks too. If they didn't go forward, we might be in trouble. We never did, never wants to go get get hooked up. I, maybe I got out in time, but uh, well, maybe you did, because as we, I I think between us uh, and other uh, agencies, uh, fifteen or twenty shopping centers were built in the downtowns in California. In the, in the 70s, uh, the economics of that were that it might cost the agency $18 million to, uh, or $18 million to assemble the land and build the parking. Uh, the developer might pay five, and that would leave a uh, agency net contribution uh, that would be covered by the new tax increment from the shop. Yeah. yeah. And so the tax increment that that single shopping center produced produced more than it costs the agents to produce enough tax increment to amortize the agency's costs. Of contributing to that shopping center. So that that model was working like a finely tuned engine until 1976. Out of my project, <laughs> rebuild. But, uh, well, no, I'm talking about Prop 13. Oh, yeah. In and, and 1976, Prop 13 passed. And instead of having property taxes at 2.5% of assessed valuation, you had property taxes of 1% of assessed valuation. And all at once, these projects were, with bonds outstanding were turned upside down. And, uh, uh, the, the, you know, one thing that, that uh, legislatures are aware of when, they, when you call it to their attention is to avoid impairments of contracts. So I worked on legislation in the California legislature to provide loans to agencies to uh, avoid going into uh, default on their tax loans from, from the state. Yeah, loans from the state it was kind of a revolving fund. Pasadena got one of those loans, and then uh, where that where the gap was really. The impact of Prop 13 was really significant and dangerous in terms of the agency's ability to come out from it. Uh, I got special legislation to impose an assessment on those shopping centers equal to the Prop 13 gap loss. And that required the shopping center developer to agree to be assessed so that yeah. his taxes would go right back up to where they were before Prop 13. And we had one one developer that did that. Yeah, we got to know a little bit though about shopping center developments. Shopping centers and most big, big developments are built under a uh, preliminary loan, building loan. Construction loan. Construction loan. At the time they're doing it, they don't know whether their place is uh, going to fill up or not. These shopping centers are owned by a developer, and usually, or at least one way they do it, the department stores own their sites 
on the basis the developer knows they'll make, if they get those department stores, they'll get the shops filled. Some of them are filled instantly. The one in Glendale Gallery was filled instantly. And so they can then finance fully. They'll, they'll play out their, their construction loan until they get a value, a really good value, in the department stores, they having weaned, weaned in the, uh, the shopping, the, the, the little stores. Well, by the time they do that, they borrow more now than the shopping center cost as a whole. And so their term retainer rate of return is uh, infinity. I mean, they're all paid off. Well, that, that shows that you can, you can almost have to pay back all of it. It's, it's the front end that gives them the trouble. They, you can almost get them to pay it back. That's right. But the, uh, you know, uh, in the, the, uh, the techniques that were developed for those shopping centers were extended to mixed use projects, really large mixed use projects, uh, where developer money was uh, put up initially and then the agency tax increment came into participation with it when it came on on board. But the the long-term impact of Prop 13, coupled with changes in the retail marketing situation, uh, basically led, number one, to a focus on, say, the distorted land use planning because property taxes were now no longer uh, the, the bonus for local government and economic development, the sales tax was. So the retail became more of a focus for uh, development than housing. And as, as uh, the retail changed to these big box, the category killers, you know, the big box retail, uh, Walmart, Walmart and, and Toys R Us, the, the, the single specialty huge retailers that would just compete and drive out uh, the local stores, uh, it's began to skew land use planning uh, in all our cities. Everybody was out for the, for the uh, big boxes. And the competition. And they're ugly too. Uh, right. And they're ugly, and when they disappear, they stay as, as abandoned buildings. So uh, the, the result, and Gene says it was all my centers, so none of his. I haven't gone back to check. The shop, the, it, it, it's interesting that you, you have, a, you're the only one, you're the only one who has the historical memory of how these projects got built and then 20 years later they have you have to come back and rebuild them or reposition or tear them down or do something i never thought i would be working on the second generation of the redevelopment projects i worked on in the 60s and the 70s but that's what's happening and so the shopping centers that were so dominant in the 70s that we worked on, all the ones that looked like retail malls and weren't open to the streets, like Horton Plaza in Pasadena, all the ones that looked like uh, big uh, prisons, the interior malls and blank walls to parking, they've all been torn down and replaced. And they only had a 20 year life cycle. Uh, I think the one isn't though is Glendale Galleria is still as far as I know as sharp as it can be and it's, it's got as open and uh, hardly open but it's in a better quality and higher quality itself yeah. when it started. Yeah. Not all of them, yeah, I shouldn't have said all of them, but uh, a good number of them have been torn down and are now, now being developed into mixed use. Uh, when we talk about housing, because you you mentioned uh, a little earlier that that we kind of presented the liberal and conservative side when we went into the legislature, and the tension from the very beginning in redevelopment has between has been a tension between uh, focus on affordable housing or focus on retail or commercial. 
commercial uh, tax generating uses? One of them. Well, at one, we we found from the left that they wanted they wanted this kind of housing. From the right, they by and large didn't want that kind of housing, except that they were getting under tremendous tensions and pressures in each city and almost anywhere for the need to uh, have a orderly housing and good, uh, good housing. One night, we were pretty late at night as I remember, we were negotiating with one of the uh, uh, housing advocates, housing advocates, one of the left, and said, you got to give us a certain percentage of of uh, tax increment, and he said at about 20%, gleefully, acting like he were be beating this up and requiring. We didn't think we had guts enough to do that, but then we went and sold the state legislature on it. As long as it wasn't coming out of state money, so they didn't mind, and so we uh, we got this 20%. The trouble with it is, and he'll tell you how it's been improved since. Trouble was it is a lot of cities which were using it for other things. Other cities just weren't going to put in local, locally any uh, big housing, uh, low income projects. So uh, they've just sitting on the money. Well, they've solved that problem. They they solved it by really requiring uh, the, the requirement now is spend it or lose it. Legislature will take it away. You spend your 20 percent, or have it committed uh, within five years after you collect uh, your tax increment, or the legislature will take it from the agency. The uh, these laws were enacted in 1975. It's about the time when redevelopment was beginning to pay off. The commercial redevelopment of downtowns was paying off the tax increment. So. Uh, the it was like the engine and the caboose. The engine was built. The engine was ready to move down the tracks. The tax increment producing projects were up and running. Now they could afford to provide 20% of that tax increment to subsidize the housing to come along. Uh, and subsidizing the housing was no new thing because, as Gene said, they used the Bunker Hill project in the 60s to sub subsidize housing in Watts. But the... Uh, that was a one-time affair. Yeah. But the effect has been that redevelopment agencies are now the largest single producers of affordable housing, very low, low, and moderate income housing in California. There's a, just a tremendous amount, millions and millions of dollars are now available for that purpose. And we were forced into it. Yeah. Forced into it and, uh, and the policing of it, as you said, is a continuous, a continuing problem to make sure it's uh, done right. Let's go to questions unless you guys. Okay, well, I, before we go to questions, I want, I want to sum up by asking you, what are the two things or two projects that you're most proud of in your career? Well, Bunker Hill, which started out as a minor project, was going to be a little bit of housing. It's twisted, mis, mis, twisted in the middle. And the skyline of Los Angeles is basically all in Bunker Hill, or as a result of the construction all around it. Every time you see a shark or any other show that gives you uh, any kind of look at LA, almost all of that started with Bunker Hill. There's 140 uh, acres right in downtown. The streets ran up and down. And couldn't get up on top. It was an 80 foot cliff in it, and 90% of it was uh, was 90% uh, of it was uh, blighted. But south of Fourth Street was not blighted, and 
I mean, not blighted by uh, the people arguing against us. But due to this, this whole idea that you don't have to have every square foot blighted, Bunker Hill became the standard. The brief was this way. It was written by myself and a, a law clerk. And uh, it was this big. There were 17 counts against us. We had to win on every one if they won on any one of the counts. Uh, we'd have, uh, we'd, they'd have declared the project invalid. That also became basic. It's, it's the basic case. Yes. Uh, most other cases not cited. But that, and that was based on the Hayes case, which uh, is mentioned in my, you know, no, I guess it isn't mentioned in the, in the thing. The Hayes case was, I was sitting in my office one day and second man in command of the Attorney General's office said, here's the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. The federal government is making them test and we, they are asking us to do a, a, a make us carry a brief. Is this constitutional or unconstitutional? I said, it's obviously constitutional under the Hayes case. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, uh, Berman, Berman versus Parker. Parker and other cases that uh, uh, work it out the same way. They, uh, oh, that was one. And the other was probably the 20% through housing. Through housing. Yeah. It's the most un, un, it's the most insufferable situation that we don't get good housing for lower income people. And that's done and done it permanently, and that's another permanent place. The third one, though, just quickly, is the San Diego Horton Plaza. If any of you from San Diego, you know Horton Plaza. That's a vertical shopping center downtown with a wonderful theater that my son started here. Started there and uh, was involved with it many years. That uh, that Horton Plaza project took a long time in coming together and. As I recall, a lot of the argument was over the design. The original design was going to be the traditional balkanized. Yeah, but they made a mistake and hired an architect. And he got, he got, he was set this thing in stage and then hired other architects to design things in it. And the and exterior design people was doing uh -huh. that. So that, was, that had real architecture involved. Yeah, and so that becomes uh, Fort Plaza and some of those others become destination places. If you go to San Diego, you want to see Horton Plaza. It's that type of a project. Uh, probably, in my career, the project I'm most proud of is not a project I worked on as a lawyer. It's a project I created in a civic capacity. Uh, the state owned 40 blocks using eminent domain and acquired 40 blocks around the state capitol. There were 600 residential tenancies and about 200 commercial tenancies. Anyway, 40 blocks of the biggest slum in Sacramento was owned by the state capitol, state of California. And they have property managers managing it. And the reason they owned it was that that's where they were going to expand the state building complex. Well, I, with a, with a very creative mayor, we were, I was able to convince the state that they were bad property managers and they ought to get out of the property management business. And we created the joint powers authority between the city of Sacramento and the state of California called the Capital Area Development Authority. Responsibility of that agency was to manage that 40 block area redevelop that 40 block area in coordination with state buildings, create a 20, 18 hour community in the city of Sacramento, and just turn that around. Uh, and with a, uh, and, and, and for a long time with virtually no tax we created the area as a separate redevelopment project, separate the, from the redevelopment agency's projects in Sacramento. And I served as chairman of it for seven years. 
Uh, one of the things I insist upon, we have a lean and mean staff of three people. I said we're, we're having an agency that is exempt from civil service. So we went out and hired college students to be our resident managers and fired the contract managers we had. And we were able to uh, hire our own personnel. Anyway, we, we managed the properties and we also redevelop, were able to redevelop properties. Today, that 40 block area is a viable, exciting neighborhood in Sacramento. And it was an experiment, but it was an opportunity for me to put it into practice some of the things I, you know, I've been thinking about as a lawyer. It's very rewarding. Yeah, we ought to get close to this. At the beginning, the federal government commanded staffs and people in every position. We had the appraisers, even though they were used at the given time. It just was a nonsensical situation. Uh, two or three agencies built up huge staffs, but all of them knew we were the staff. And maybe our uh, associate attorney, uh, city managers would uh, be working directly direct with city managers, and most of your time in this is spent appearing in front of city councils. And it's uh, a challenging event. You know, you walk into a building and you know darn well the five votes are there against you. You walk out and you got the five votes. Uh, but that's a good part of our, uh, well, late member, my wife talks about one city I was in where I was up all night in a public hearing until four in the morning. And then went home. Sometimes it's ten minutes. Yeah, that's right. We were deep in all of it. You want to go to uh, questions now? Anybody have any questions of us? We've covered a lot of topics. In that. What were your backgrounds before you law school? What was uh, what was your background, Gene, before law school? Oh, I was in the Navy for uh, three years. I see, two years. I was one of the GI Bill people, and I was a playground director. Uh, at, while in law school at Berkeley. And, uh, and my law school experience was more of a classical one. I don't know whether you people have had an English, early English pleading or not, but I may be one of the lawyers still alive who had early English pleading in Berkeley. Uh, I had more of a classical, not my education beforehand, my education beforehand was in political science, uh, philosophy, very broad. And I was allowed to go to law school because I've been a veteran. Three years after, uh, after uh, three years of undergraduate, they let me go in, and many, many lawyers went in that way in a lot of law schools. I, I'd like to make, make one comment about you, you people in law school. It's, you won't even know what you're going to be when you get out there, except a patent attorney or something like that. All of a sudden, your destiny hits you, and it, it, work, it works, you follow your own. I, I believe in muddling through. This is, what we're doing here, describing, is muddling through. We get lost in something before you know I muddle. Our, That's our, right. My the chief partner in my firm right now, we were trying to figure out a very really tough patent tough insurance, quick, quick uh, use. When you have quick use in eminent domain, you get possession. You don't get that title. The title companies would not give you the title policy. We were trying to buy these properties early without the proper money. We needed to change. We couldn't figure it out. And here's early, this kid just barely out of law school. He walks through, here's the apartment, and so on. Yeah. I mean, you're, I've, you, you, you should recognize that you learn it out there, which you really do. Even when you think you learn it in here, you're not learning it. You can't do it without having learned what you learn in here. But you don't have any idea what you're 
Yeah. Told me I'd do it. I tell my grandma. It's cold there. I'm thinking be in Romania every week. I tell, I tell my grandchildren that. I've got a got one in college now, two earlier, but you don't know what you're going to do because you don't know what, you don't even know what's out there and you don't know what the opportunities are. I, I started writing for uh, sports for a local newspaper. I covered all the high school sports while I was in high school. Then I went to junior college and I became the publicity director while I was going to junior college for the football and the basketball and the baseball teams of the junior college. So when I went to uh, University of California, Berkeley, I became, what else, a journalism major and uh, uh, graduated with a, with a degree in journalism and had no intention of going to law school, but because of my, uh, in, in Cal, if you wanted to be a reporter, you went to Northwestern, someplace else. If you wanted to be a journalism major at Cal at that time, you studied and grounded yourself in political science, international economics, uh, history, and so forth. So I had more units in that category than I had in journalism. The one thing I graduated feeling is I'm not ready to be a reporter. There's too much out there that I still want to explore. So I entered law school because I didn't want to work <laughs> as a reporter. I, and, I didn't want to work as a newspaper or that from me. Just after I yeah. And I worked uh, I, in college and in law school. I don't think you could do that today, I don't know, but I worked 35 hours a week going through law school and undergraduate because my parents couldn't afford to pay for my college education. We didn't have student loans. He was about eight, 10 years younger, so he didn't have GI Bill. Yeah, uh, but when I graduated from law school, I met the same folk, I, I'm at the same point in my life as I still don't know what I want to do. And but one thing I'm very concerned about is going to work for a big huge law firm and just becoming a minion, working on litigation for two years of my life. Uh, and but I was very fortunate in my career track. Uh, I kind of felt that uh, I'm, I'm going to, about every two years, I'll try a different aspect of the law. So I went to work for the state. I went to work for the Legislative Council, learned how to draft laws, and then uh, I became a redevelopment attorney. Uh, I didn't know a deed for an easement to... Well, this law was just created about the time we... Yeah, law school, law school. Right. And then I became city attorney. And then when I joined my firm, uh, after being city attorney, I had a passion for what I ended up uh, devoting my career to. And that was a passion for uh, rebuilding cities and improving the quality of urban life. And I got the same place. My son asked me when he was working three years summers for us, What's the passion in there? What happened? We, in our office, we cared. And it was a passion. Solving problems is a heck of a lot of fun, too. This is it's not uh, the minion being the minion. That's right. Anything else? Yes, that's what we did. Is that yeah. what we did? Yes. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you if you had found this in what you've done. I think we both have. Uh, to to uh, 
that someone once told me in my firm, said, I envy you tremendously because you have been able to integrate your practice of law with your hobby and with your personal interest and with your traveling. Yeah, I, I would have worked for free except my wife bought me to bring money home. Gene is one of the few persons that, that uh, uh, I can, you know, I've been friended who can talk about any topic. And, and uh, uh, you can let your, you can let your hair down, you can talk about religion, you can talk about politics, whatever, uh, without uh, fear of censure or controversy or anything else. And we, we've had some uh, spirited discussions. Uh, yeah, but the issue is they're trying, how do we solve this problem? Yeah, that's right. You dummy, why did not you know that before? <laughs> <laughs> so that Murray doesn't get the good the, the Yeah. Let me just ask, because I have been the beneficiary of this, but uh, I have you, Gene, and I suspect you've had the same experience as being a phenomenal mentor to those working around you. And I suppose the question is, based on your experience, how do you sort of develop the ability to do that mentoring? And if you're a young lawyer, how do you find the people who will give you that kind of mentoring training? That's a good question. I'd like to ask this. Most of the lawyers in my law firm that were good could not mentor. I wandered down the hall and mentor a young attorney and find out that uh, he was in trouble and I'd go and tell a guy and he hadn't noticed. You gotta find the mentors. I don't know where you find the mentors first. There's plenty of plenty of kids that want to be mentored, although I don't think they know they ought to be. But mentoring is the key to this whole thing. You ought to practice the law. If you even go as a minion, don't be a minion. You get a mentor. When I look, uh, I look back, I had uh, mentors that were important to my practice. Uh, and they were different types of people. But they were, uh, and, and they led by example, not by lecture. And uh, I tried to mentor that way myself, but the difficulty is that the practice of law now is structured such. It's structured for production and not for teaching. And so my opportunities to, and I, I think we're both teachers. The, the when, when we have a sabbatical program in our firm about every 10 years, 10% of the partners are off on sabbatical. When my first sabbatical, which was at the very beginning of the program, kind of set a high standard for others because I was invited to teach at MIT, actually institute a course in land use and redevelopment in the Graduate School of Urban Studies at MIT. And with a higher aptitude in science and math than anything else. I was way up there. It was like a wonderful opportunity to spend four months at that institution. But I'm, uh, I think deep down I'm a teacher. Uh, it shows up the way I negotiate, and it shows up uh, uh, the way I like to to uh, communicate with other members of my firm, and uh, uh, it's probably it's been very important to me to have mentors, and I tried to be a mentor for others. Well, I could practice, gave up an awful lot of money, and became a teacher. Anybody that comes to this institution to teach gives up money. 
if they're any good as a lawyer. And uh, so I, the teaching is out for me too. Yeah. Are there firms in Salt Lake that are doing this kind of redevelopment work and do you know what they are? Are there firms in Salt Lake City that do redevelopment work, Gene? Do you know what they are? No, uh, no I didn't. He didn't really, he, he never added to his staff. Um, sometime he had some person with him. I've forgotten his name at the moment. If you want to give me your address, I'll, uh, I'll find out. Thanks. Uh, he'd know of, I, I don't even know who's doing this whole life thing. Up there, they don't need a redevelopment, right? They just need the Mormon church with plenty of money. <laughs> Everyone's up, I can't believe it even makes sense. But they're doing what you're saying. They tore down all the stores. All the stores. And they're starting over and they're talking about two billion, two, two, two billion, two billion, two billion, two billion, yeah. two billion dollars of development. So whether you, if you can get involved with the church's attorneys, or the city attorneys that are working on that, there's jobs available that are going to run somewhat in the very training you'd get if you were with one of us. The Urban Land Institute, uh, Gene was a very active member and got me into it, uh, held its uh, conference in Salt Lake City last spring and and uh, had, a, had presentations on on uh, some of those projects. But they, they were presentations by staff people. I didn't see any attorneys there. Thank you very much for allowing us to reminisce. Thanks. Sure, here. I didn't think you'd be here. I just, I didn't know about this. I just walked into the library with this photo and saw it's advertised. So. Well, I, we sent notice to you. What? Yeah, well, theirs is on the floor somewhere. Did, did I tell you about what he did to me once? Both our offices were absolute messes. Both were lost. Thank you.